Um, hello, thank you for having me. My name is Lisa Reichelt. Um, I talk funny, but actually I'm from here originally. I left um, Sydney almost 10 years ago to move to the UK and it ruined my accent completely. <laughs> so I have to always kind of go, no, seriously, I'm like from out west of Dubbo. Trust me, it's true. Um, so I, I came back when I saw what was starting to happen at the Digital Transformation Office, when I knew that it, it well, so when I first found out about it, it was part of the Department of Communications, um, which was an okay place for it to be, I guess. Uh, and it sounded as though they were gonna do some sensible things, and I thought it would be lovely to come back from working at the Government Digital Service in the UK and bring some of that back you know, to work for my own people. Um, and the very day that I was getting on the plane to move back with my family to Australia, uh, somebody texted me in the morning and said, you should check the news. And it was the spill. Ooh. Yeah, it was a special moment. Anyway, so um, we, we got on the plane and we got off the plane in Sydney to discover that Turnbull was the Prime Minister. Uh, and as a result of that, we moved out of communications and into the Prime Minister and Cabinet Office and our responsible minister is now the Prime Minister. <laughs> so that's a fairly cool place to be. Um, anyway, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the experience that I had working in the UK in the Government Digital Service and what we learned from that and what we're, we're leaving behind and what we've decided to bring with us to the UK. There's a few of us who have moved over from the UK to come and work as part of the DTO. Um, and I also just want to have a bit of a kind of general rant about fake user centeredness and what real user centeredness actually means. Because I think that if all of the companies who really were doing what they said they were doing about caring about users, making technology actually work, come on. This isn't even my machine. I'm having such bad technology luck today, it's not funny. Fix it, Joe, fix it. Where is even the thing? File. I don't even know where it leaves. It's on the desk. It's on the desktop, isn't it? There it is. Come on, keynote. What was that article that was written? So in London yesterday, they had an IX Day meetup, and it was all about how rubbish Apple's UX actually is, based on that course. Did you see the course seventy seven article that was it John Norman wrote? Yeah, so I'm doing a live demo of that right now. Okay, so as I was saying, if all of these organisations who said that they cared about users as much as they actually, if they did it as much as they actually said that they did, then we should be in some kind of consumer utopia, right? Dealing with our banks should be awesome. Dealing with our governments should be amazing. But the reality is that it's not at all, is it? Well, certainly that's not my experience, particularly working with, like, doing dealings with large organisations. They're the most rubbish of them all, even though they're the ones who spend the most at conferences and stuff telling you how amazing, how, how incredibly much they value you. And the reason for that, I think, is because really, when it comes down to it, most user centeredness is this, right? Um, it's, it's a lot of talk in marketing, and when they actually do set out to do it, it's a lot of people in boardrooms doing workshops pretending that they're users. Yeah, people who probably haven't ever had the actual real experience of being anything like the actual people who they claim to be their end users, imagining that they can somehow channel what it's like to be them, and often using data as a way to justify these beliefs that they have, even though they're framing their interpretation of the data completely on their own experiences, which is usually wrong. Is it just me, or have you had this experience as well? <laughs> yes, okay, fierce nodding. I usually get that. So I got really excited when I heard about this, right? This was this is what um, WK looked like when it was a baby, when it was in its alpha. This is the very first version of um, WK. I keep getting GovAU and GovUK mixed up at the moment, so hopefully you'll understand what I mean contextually, because I may get it wrong. I do it in meetings all the time. It's very embarrassing. Um, it looks incredibly daggy now, I think. It's about five years old, but at the time, everyone was like, ooh, so shiny for a government site. Very exciting. Um, the, the big picture at the top there was done specifically for ministers. So the target audience for the Alpha in many ways were the ministers who they wanted to, to get to approve it, and so you needed a little bit of shiny. Um, 
what, I, what excited me about this was that there are a lot of very smart people who were talking a lot about users and saying that they were going to base things on user needs, not government needs, and they were going to be user-centred, and I, I believed them. And then when they launched, this is what they wrote. And I thought, I don't know about you, but that actually doesn't sound like being user-centred to me. That sounds like standing around in the room, looking at data, pretending that you know what a user is, not actually going anywhere near them. Um, I got a bit disappointed about that and I wrote a blog about it. Um, they got angry at me for writing the blog about it and being mean about people who are trying to do good things in government. But the thing is that if you're doing government stuff, you're often dealing with some really important stuff. It's really important that you don't screw it up. And you look at that and you go, well, that's not rocket science, is it? And it's not. As soon as you've done the research, this is the thing about user research, is that once you've done the research, you go, well, this is all bloody obvious, isn't it? But it's not obvious until you've done the research. And that's, you know, like, who does user research here? Any researchers in the house? You know that feeling when you've gone out and you've worked really hard to do some great research. You get back with your deck and you go, this is all completely obvious. And when you're young and new at this, you go, they're going to think that I'm shit. But when you're older and crustier like me, you go, this means that I've actually done a good job. But that's, that's research in a nutshell. Anyway, so for a little while, I was kind of a bit cross about the opportunity that they were missing, I think. And then I got the chance, kind of coincidentally, to go and work with this merry crew who likes stickers and cake a lot. <laughs> Um, by the stage I went to work with them, they'd gone from alpha to beta and from beta to live, and it looked quite different, much less shiny, much more functional, like this. GovUK was the, the publishing platform, basically, for the UK government. They pulled together an awful lot of what had previously been thousands of different uh, UK government websites into one big one. There were still other ones as well, but there was basically one big one that was infinitely better than what came before it. They did other stuff as well. They worked on what they called the transformation project. So they did 25 projects with departments all over government, looking at things like um, registering to vote. They complete, we completely changed um, the process of how you vote. So it used to be that you, that you registered as a household, which is like something from the 1600s. Uh, they changed that into individual electoral registration, which was like a huge electoral reform program. And we did the digital service for that. Uh, and things like renewing your passport, there's some tax stuff, there's some driving license stuff, like lots of big, important things. Going out, working in departments, with departments, teaching them how to do agile, user-centered design, uh, without having to rely on enormous big system integration organizations, which they've done in the past. It was challenging and fun. And then there was the project that I went to join, which was this one. This is the Identities Project, or GovUK Verify, as it turned out. Um, and this was a, a kind of a different one because we'd inherited this one from the DWP, which was like the DHS in the UK. They started working on this and then they saw we came along and I don't know exactly how we ended up with it, but they kind of thought this is a hard, horrible project, let's throw it over there and they can fail with it instead of us. And that was the one that we got. Um, but the, the, in, the kind of good thing about it was that it came with its own budget. So the rest of GDS had a budget, and then Identity had a budget, and that meant that when I got hired, I didn't have to work on any other projects except for this one. And that was kind of nice, because it meant that then I could be embedded in the team, work as part of a multidisciplinary agile team as the only user researcher, um, and we could get into doing a nice iterative uh, process where we'd go into research and learn about what the problems were and design some possible solutions and put them into the prototype and then do it again and again and again. Basic stuff. Basic stuff, but stuff that wasn't happening really anywhere else in GDS at the time. And as a result of that process, we could pretty quickly start to solve the problems that had for about four years completely stumped everybody, which impressed people. And they're like, huh, maybe there is something to this research after all. Um, they had previously been quite skeptical about that because elsewhere in GDS there were user researchers, about three or four of them who were in charge of all of the other stuff. So all of the GovUK stuff, GovUK is an enormous, enormous website with a very diverse audience. All of that, all of the 25 projects that they were doing with departments and a bunch of other stuff that GDS was doing as well had to be covered by about three or four researchers who broke down their sort of daily workload into like one-eighth 
uh, and did the absolute best that they could, but there's only so much you can do when you're responsible for working on about eight projects at the same time. <coughs> so because they were so thinly stretched, they couldn't do really great work. Uh, and that kind of justified the view that a lot of people had originally, which was that you know data was actually more helpful than this user research malarkey anyway. User research was some kind of a pseudoscience, unlike data, which told you the truth. This was a very insightful piece of truth-giving data known as um, the Content Explorer, which mapped um, what they would call engagement. Have you seen this kind of thing before? There's this kind of belief that some people like to have, which is that there's some kind of sweet spot between the amount of traffic that a piece of content gets and the amount of time that people spend on it that tells you whether or not that content is doing a good job. Anybody else have to suffer through this kind of craziness as well? Yeah. Um, so this is a lovely kind of convenient truth to have, which explodes pretty much as soon as you start to actually watch somebody try to answer uh, the actual question that they have with the actual piece of content. And you realize that actually engagement data and confusion data are very similar. <laughs> um, so that was kind of interesting. Anyway, so as you can imagine, I continued moaning about the way that some of this stuff was happening at GDS until the point when that terrifying thing happened and the boss turns around and goes, fine, then fix it. And you go, fuck off. <laughs> Actually, it's much easier to moan. Um, this has been my big realization about getting involved in actually trying to fix government stuff is that it's infinitely, infinitely easier to moan about it. Um, but anyway, it was, a, it was an opportunity to, to work in an organization who, were, who was saying all of the right things and I could actually help them try to do the right things. Um, so I made a map, I made a kind of a plan, this is what my plan was, I had lots of... I actually found this on my second last day at GDS when I was cleaning out my cupboard. It was interesting to look back over a couple of years and see um, what a, you know, where we kind of started with. All of this stuff, I don't even know what this stuff means anymore. The important stuff is over here, which is the numbers. Because the real thing that you need to know if you want to try to be more user-centered is that you need to hire more user researchers. It's not rocket science really at all. Uh, this is the one thing that everybody goes, well, you know, I really want to do it, but I can't hire anybody else. And I'm like, fine, don't bother. Don't bother, because actually, this is the most important thing. If you care about being more user-centered, you need more people who can go out and speak to users and help your teams understand users and help your teams actually do something about what they understand about users. And that just takes people. You need people. So what I discovered was that if you make rules that have numbers in them, public servants follow them. So we started making some rules. Uh, and this was one of the rules that we made, have a researcher embedded in the team at least three days a week. The, the three there is actually a really important thing. But of course what we got was people going, well, you know, I don't understand why you're asking me to do this because it only takes a couple of days a week to do the research. What are they going to do the rest of the time? What am I going to do with a researcher sitting around all of those days while everyone's writing code and doing important things? Um, and of course, we kind of agreed with that one. Yeah, you know, it's true. You probably only do spend about 30% of your time actually doing the research. The rest of your time, you're spending making sure that your team know about what you learned in the research and that they're actually doing something with it, that they actually care about it and that they're actually paying attention to it and they're actually making decisions based on what they've learned in the research. Otherwise, it's just a monumental waste of time. So if you're not going to spend time communicating the research to your team, just don't do it in the first place. And I think this is what you get a lot of the time with user research, is that it's a box ticking exercise. People kind of feel that you have to do the research, but you don't actually have to do anything with it. And somebody will say, well, how much research have you done? I get this all the time in government. How many, how many bits of interviews have you done? How many people have you spoken to? How much have you done, right? As if there's like a bar you have to get over and then whoever gets over the highest bar wins, but it doesn't, nobody ever says, well, what have you done? What have you done about the research? What have you done because you've learned these things? And I think that's the most important thing is, actually doing something with it. And that's what takes the time, right? It's actually being there with your team, hearing the crazy conversations that they have where they're clearly doing stuff that's directly the opposite to what they should be doing because of the research and stopping them. 
and being involved in the prioritization meetings, being, being involved in all of those little conversations that happen when if you're a researcher who's tasked across eight projects, you're going to completely miss it. You're going to come back when it's the time in the sprint for the research to happen and go, why hasn't anything happened? Why hasn't anything changed? Why is there any better? And it's because you're not there. So there's this kind of weird um, ratio that everybody seems to believe is true, right? Which is that you, you really only need one researcher for at least maybe three designers and you only need like a designer per... I think the last thing I heard was six developers, one designer per six developers. Does that sound about right to you? Yeah. What the hell? It's just, if you've got really hard problems to solve, you need lots of researchers. And we got to the point at GDS where we, we always had more researchers than designers. That was just always the truth. And there was actually one point where we had more researchers than developers. Everyone started to freak out then, and to be fair, that was mostly because we were having trouble hiring good developers at the time. But it, it was the reality, and the reality was because we said that we wanted to be really user-centered, and we had a lot of very tricky problems that we needed to understand. So of course we had lots of researchers. But it's, I think it's really important to try and reset this crazy ratio and say, really what you need is one good researcher per team. Per project team, you need a good researcher. And that, that's what the ratio should be. I think the other thing, important thing is that it's really useful to have researchers kind of working over the breadth of the customer journey as well. So you don't just want to have a researcher who's an expert in bookings, for example. You want to have, you want, to, you want them to understand the arc of the journey that people are going through. That helps them to sort of make more intelligent decisions and be able to, to contribute better. There's a whole pub discussion about exactly how you should structure your teams, which we can do later if you like. So when people say to me, I can't hire any more researchers, I'm like, well, fine, pick your most important project and put your research on that project and just leave the rest. Don't try and stretch your one good research across everything and completely compromise your ability to do good work in the team. Pick your most important project, put them on that, let the rest go to hell. <laughs> I always need a little calming down moment after that bit. Kittens. All right, so the next thing about being properly user-centered is completely obvious, which is that you should meet some users sometimes. Um, again, when I first started working at GDS, this was something that we did, let's say, sporadically. We, we met users occasionally. We, we often outsourced the, the meeting of users to agencies. Um, so, of course, to try to fix that, we made a rule. We had to put a number in it. So you have to do user research in every sprint, which kind of implies at least every two weeks. And we said, just get five people in a lab for one-on-one -on -one interviews and usability testing. That's it. Now, you probably immediately look at that and go, well, that's not the right way to do research for everything. And you would be completely right. But if you do that, then public servants can put an amount of money in a budget before they even come and talk to you about what the project is. And then you've got money to hire a researcher and hire a lab and procure participants to come and do research as well. And once you've got a good researcher, then they can go, oh, okay, well, with this much money, this is what we should be doing. Um, and that's, you know, having the money to hire the people to do the research is way more important than anything else. So this is what I learned really quickly, was just get rid of this whole it depends shtick that we designers and researchers have all the time. How should we do this? Well, it depends. If you say that to senior people, they just go, fine, then I'll we'll get a committee or a steering group or somebody can white, write a white paper and we'll keep, we'll keep developing the stuff and, you know, and, and your stuff is clearly too hard and difficult, so we'll come back to that later. So you just take all the ambiguity out of it, make it incredibly simple for people to make calculations and put things into spreadsheets. And then once you've got the money, you can, you can hire a good person and let them do what they need to do. And while we were at it, we made some more rules with numbers in it a very important one. I don't know if you're familiar with this concept of exposure hours. It's um, one that I learned from Jared Spool uh, of UIE. There's the, you can just Google it. But you, this, he, his organization did some research where they tried to establish what is it about teams that mean that some teams can do really good projects that actually deliver good user experiences for people and some teams just can't. 
what's the difference? Is it how many designers or what school the designers went to? Or is it agile and waterfall? Is it the ratio? What's you know what's what is it that makes a difference? And they discovered that the difference that really the thing that you could do that really really made the difference was to get everybody in the organisation, well in the team from the senior stakeholders all the way through the entire team to actually observe real people using their thing at least two hours every six weeks. If everybody is actually having that experience, then everybody in the team will make decisions that will help to contribute to a better user experience. And they'll care about the user experience more. And that's the thing that made the difference. So we made this rule, and then all of a sudden, up in far northeastern England, in Newcastle, uh, we started seeing things like this pop up, and this is HMRC, which is the, at the UK's tax department, which is nowhere was nowhere near as user-centred as the Australian tax department, made this dashboard, because if you give people rules with numbers, they have to make dashboards out of them. So they made this one, and this personally is the best dashboard that I've ever seen in my entire life, living in, in a tax department in England. It's, like, it's a small miracle. Um, Anyway, um, this is my, you know, I just like to put funny things in. We're going to talk about elephants now, believe it or not. I talk about elephants most days, it feels like. This is another part of being user-centered. Five minutes, I've got to go really fast. Understanding the elephant, which might make not very much sense, but basically what it means is that you need to make sure that you understand the real, whole, complete context of the problem that you're trying to solve. I don't know if you've heard the story of the blind man and the elephant. I mean, the multiple blind men approach elephant from different directions, grab a part and start to describe it. And the guy who gets the trunk goes, oh, I've got a very large stake. The guy who gets the tail goes, I've got a stick. Somebody gets the legs, oh, it's like a big tree. Tommy, he's like a wall. Um, and they're all completely right in terms of describing the thing, the part, the anatomy that they've got but none of them are going anywhere near describing an actual elephant. So they're all right, but they're all completely wrong. And government is, a, is an expert of doing this, right? So, for example, in, in WK, we had people who were really, really amazing at knowing the user needs of particular types of tax benefits that you would get if you are uh, accessing childcare. And we had other people who were really expert in the kinds of benefits that you would get if you had small children. And then we had other people who were really, really expert in understanding the kinds of childcare that might be available in particular parts of the country. So lots of people had lots of different bits of individual expertise that were to do with childcare. Um, but even once we brought all of those onto GovUK, because we sort of relied on the, the expert knowledge of each people in each different part of government, We'd done like tails and trees and walls and snakes and stuff instead of doing an elephant. So people still had to search to about eight different parts of the website to pull together all of the information that they needed to be able to make a decision about whether or not they could afford to go back to work after they'd have a child, if you know what I mean. I think if you, if you do your research down here, at a, at a product level, in the silo of your organisation, you do a really bad job of letting people do the thing that they're actually trying to do because you don't understand it. You're not seeing the gaps. Um, and if you if you work in a hierarchical silo, siloed organisation like government, and you're not, if no, it's nobody's job to sort of bridge this gap, then you can pretty much guarantee that the bit in the middle is going to be horrendous and nobody even knows. Nobody's even capturing the data. So we made another rule. This one doesn't really have a number in it. Um, but it's about telling people that they have to do contextual user research in the discovery stage. Uh, so this is part of the kind of the simplification process where we say, well, you know, what do you do in discovery? Well, you could do this, you could do that. We just go do contextual research and make a map. And then, then at least you'll have something useful. What do we get? So what, what's the value that the organisations get if they actually do this kind of work? It's simple things, like actually designing the right thing. Um, I don't know about you, how long you've been doing this kind of work. If you cast your, back over the, your mind back over the last five years, how often do you think you were working on a project that was actually solving the real problem? Anyone? Ever? 
Yeah, no, okay. Yeah, it's, it's like that though, isn't it? Like so often we're working really hard, but, but we kind of know that we're not working on the right thing. That's terrible. And it's because our organizations tend to do this. This is my very bad drawing of the, the um, development design process that we use uh, at GDS and also at the DTO. And it starts at the beginning of the project where everyone has their preconceived ideas about what the problem is and what the solution probably is. And you're supposed to go through discovery where you understand the problem from the user's point of view into alpha where you explore what the design solutions might be and then into beta where you start to iteratively build that out so that you get happy users. But inevitably, everybody always wants to take this big shortcut over the top because the, here they think they know what the solution is already and they just want to start making it. But actually, by the time they get here, they suddenly, like, we all kind of know we're doing the wrong thing. So we have to go through this process. And then we make maps. This is one that we made for the Criminal Justice Service in the UK. Um, and it just, it's one of those things, again, where you look at it and you go, well, of course that's how criminal justice works. Uh, except that nobody had ever actually seen and understood the whole process in, in like normal plain language ever before. And as soon as you do it, then you can actually map things over the top of that and go, God, like you should see the way that information currently passes through this system or more to the case doesn't. It's kind of terrifying. You see opportunities to fix problems in a way that you just don't see usually. The other thing that you get to do is that you get to fix Problems that we as a, as, a, as a profession should have solved such a long, long, long time ago. Um, I'm going to show you an example of a video, and I, I could show you an hour of videos like this, of somebody um, just doing an interaction that we probably have done ourselves about five or six times this week already. <laughs> You're not allowed to laugh. You can only laugh if you don't have a, a, a design like this anywhere in any of the stuff that you're responsible for. That's her boyfriend. So she's 30, she works in an office. I mean, you can laugh all you like, right? But like I said, I can show you an hour of videos like this with no trouble at all. And if you went to any effort to try and find people who identify themselves as being not particularly confident online to do usability testing, you'd have loads of these videos as well. And the fact is that as soon as we change these to text boxes and just let her type in, the date and the month and the year, she's completely fine. But instead, because we've chosen to put in these horrendous long drop downs, she feels completely humiliated. Um, we've known about this for at least 15 years, probably longer, and still every day we put UI like that into our staff. And it's not okay. <laughs> I've got one minute left, so I'm going to tell you really quickly about stuff that I've learned that I'm bringing to Australia. Um, so I, I moved back here in the middle of September. <laughs> I showed this slide in Canada, they nearly wet themselves. Um, we are pretty much stealing wholesale the design principles. We are, we're just using the design principles that GDS posted. If you're not familiar with them, you should steal them as well. They're very good, and they're not very good just for interaction designers. They're very good to say to your entire organisation, this is how we should be working. This is how we should be making decisions. So you should steal that as well. We're also more or less stealing the digital by default service standard, which just lays out, uh, uh, I think the Australian one's 14 points and the British one might be 16 points. Just like a good way of checking whether or not you are doing a project well. Number one, I obviously like a lot. Um, if you don't pass this standard in the UK and then the Australian federal government, it's optional at the moment for states, you can't put your stuff live. So it's, it's incredibly important. 
We're stealing a lot of stuff from the design patterns. These are also publicly published. If you don't want to make embarrassing videos like the one I just showed you, you should steal them too. There's a lot of guidance up there about things like dates, uh, genders, um, how to do gender, and all just like basic form stuff that we shouldn't even be thinking about anymore. So go steal that yourself as well. And we're also stealing loads of stuff um, for in terms of like basic prototyping frameworks as well, because it just makes it really fast. Unlike GDS, we will be involving users properly from day one. So this is our first schedule for the first bit of prototyping work that we're doing, and you can see on day four, we did our first bit of user research, and we've been doing it the whole way through. Um, and the other thing that we're doing differently as well is that instead of just thinking about user needs as individual granular things, we're making sure that we're, we're kind of making the map. We're understanding the elephant and we're contextualizing that in terms of the things that people are actually trying to do. So for example, one of the projects that we're working on with our department in Australia is uh, the business registration process. So we're not just looking at going out and talking to people about the process of registering their business. I'm, I'm, this is like my second last slide, I promise. Um, we're making sure that we understand the, the whole experience of starting up a business so that we can really see where the opportunities are for improvement. Uh, our first piece of work is looking at what Galbayu might be. Um, we're working on that right now. We've got ridiculously tight deadlines, so hopefully you'll have something to see towards the end of this year, early next year. Um, I'd have, can I show just a really quick video? <laughs> this is why we do it. I'm 67, and I've done the last in the power of attorney for my, for my mother. My mum's grasp on uh, modern day living as it was, was a bit limited, so it was decided then that I would pay all the bills, sort everything out for her. Three years ago I had a, a stroke, and you start thinking about your own mortality. And you start thinking about, well, if something had have happened to me, then how would mum have coped? What would have happened? Anyway, looking on the internet, and I literally stumbled across the government site for the lasting power of attorney. Started to look at it and I thought, this is good, because you can download all the paperwork yourself. You don't need a solicitor and the instructions that went with each section of the last power of attorney were they were in proper people speak not in people jargon so it was very easy for me to follow it if i can do it anybody can do it you know it it's easy the written instructions you just can't go wrong. And I would say now to anybody, don't be frightened. Don't worry about going to see a solicitor. Do it yourself. I'm glad I did it, and I'm glad I did it when I did it. And, uh, and my mum's really pleased. And can I say thank you? I just want to say thank you to everybody involved in doing the website because it's given me peace of mind and I'm sure it gives a lot of people peace of mind and my friend now is doing that and you've made it so simple and so easy for, for anybody to do and I just hope that anybody who sees this film please do it and you'll feel so relieved afterwards. You know, it's, it's great to know that the people that you care for, everything's looked after for them. Thank you.